When the routing guide fails and you need extra capacity, it helps to have a strategic partner. That's where Surge Transportation's real-time pricing and capacity come in. Built on our proprietary logic and market data, the real-time pricing tool provides instant market pricing, backed by a 100% tender accept guarantee. With instant rates, simple integration, and guaranteed acceptance, we take the unpredictability out of sourcing extra truckload capacity. Truck it. I'm Dooner here with Michael Vincent, the dude, and we're coming to you live from uh, this post F3 world. Right? It's a better world, isn't it? it is. I think we I think it we stepped everything world. up a notch after last week. It is a better world <laughs> since then. It's good to be back. It's good to be back on a, on a regular schedule. It was awesome, like meeting someone and making so much content. But it's hard to like get the content out there when you're like making it at the same time and hanging out with so many people. But it was it was yeah. great. It was awesome. And um, I don't know if you heard the news. But F3 is coming back to Chattanooga yeah. next year. Sweet. It's like November 7th to 9th, if I'm not mistaken. I think you're but dead on. 7th to 9th. Yeah. And before yeah. that, this spring we got Cleveland. So it's going to be really, yeah. really, really cool. Did you happen to get a Powerball ticket? I did not. I had just enough money for uh, for a, a bag of, uh, of uh, beef, uh, you know, beyond beef uh, jerky. So I had to go with that. Smooth. I picked that over the $1.9 billion. Why? <laughs> It was a spicy one, my friend. Plus, the odds are just not there, man. Have you looked at the odds? What are the odds? So the odds are like 292 million to one of winning that Powerball, right? Yeah. So you got a better chance of several things. Being eaten by a shark. Not if you don't go swimming. If you don't go swimming. Yeah, that's true. If you don't swim in the ocean, you're probably not going to. Filling out a perfect NCAA bracket. You, you have a, if you buy a Powerball ticket, you have a better chance of winning Powerball than doing that. You, you have to fill it up. No, if you don't fill it out, you do. All right. Well, what are the odds of Alabama losing twice in a season? Pretty good. Pretty good. Well, now they are. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyways, we had an awesome show today. We're going to hear from the author of a real, or the co-author of a really awesome supply chain book. And I see cool. him waiting in the green room. All right. uh, we're going to talk to an awesome trucking photographer who's got, I don't know, what, like two million safe miles driving on the road. Yeah. Two decades of portfolio, photography portfolio. we got a right. great F3 recap video and all that stuff. So let's tip the band, and we'll get right over to... Our friend Radu. Surge Transportation now offers digital autonomous load booking for their carrier partners. Visit loads.surgetransportation.com 24 7 to book loads at competitive market rates with the click of a button and book it now through leading industry load boards. Do it. Saw that team over there at F3. They were doing great. Oh, but yeah. Look, it's Radu over here. He's a managing director over at Alcott Global, but more importantly, he is the co author of a brand new book called From Source to Sold. Radu, it's so great to see you. Great to be with you guys. Hey, tell us a little bit about this. So last time I talked to you, you know, we were talking about executive search and all those things. I didn't know that in the background you were busy talking to all these amazing leaders across the supply chain to put together your brand new book. Tell us a little bit about how that book came together. And in fairness, when we last spoke, I don't know if I even knew that myself, oh, <laughs> that wow. we're going to end up putting wow. a book together. So, you know, here, here it is now, right? So from source to soul, I'm trying to capture the, uh, the, the book on the screen. Um, so basically around about a year ago, myself and Knut um, came together and we were talking like, how can we make all these cool stories in supply chain a bit more public, right? And, and get people to know them, to read about them. and brag a little bit or put it in the spotlight, all the success stories within the industry. So this book is an, basically an answer to that question for us. Um, and we interviewed 26 of some of the most successful chief supply chain officers, chief operations officers, CEOs that came from logistics, from transport, from supply chain and made it to CEO position. And we tried to distill what made them successful. So this is the book, and also we come up with the model. I'll tell you about that model as well. Um, but source to sold is basically the answer to that particular question. It's very, very interesting. How did you decide which people to select? You selected those 26, right? Did you have this wish list that you went for and created and go after them? 
Look, we, we also had Tim Cook on the list, but he didn't join this edition <laughs> of the book. <laughs> we, we hope to catch him for the next one. Um, so it, it, we have a very diverse um, uh, plethora of leaders. Um, mm -hmm. We basically went wide and and um, very um, diverse. We tried to have uh, from you know gender to background to industry, we tried to cover it all, right? To even function, right? We've had from procurement to chief supply chain officers, chief operations officers, CEOs, entrepreneurs, people. Uh, for example, we have the story of Revigo, which is a 10 billion plus tech a startup scale up now in India, right? A fantastic freight um, and transportation type of a company. So we try to give people uh, examples of where it has been done in all sorts of varied corners of the earth, in varied industries. And we also tried to avoid the potential excuse, oh, you know, it's uh, it only works in FMCG or it only works in automotive or it only works in, I don't know, transport and logistics. It doesn't work in my industry. Not at all. We have 26 success stories in very varied backgrounds from people that that range from uh, 40 years with one company, right? Chief mm -hmm. Supply Chain Officer of Colgate. He was 40 years in, in one company to people that uh, that have built companies themselves. What surprised you the most as you were trying to figure out what makes these leaders tick? Did you find out that there was a common theme or is the common theme that there wasn't one? A little bit of both, really. So um, <laughs> the chain model um, and each of the letters, right, C stands for collaborative, H stands for holistic, A for adaptable, I for influential, N for narrative. So that's the commonalities, right? There's this skill sets that all of them in one way or another said are important to make it as a leader in supply chain. Mm. At the same time, all of them came from different angles. So I can't say that there's one path to Rome, right? There are many different roads to Rome. There were a couple of interesting points that almost none of them actually studied supply chain. Some had studied logistics. So logistics is older, as you know. Logistics is as old as wars. <laughs> I guess it was invented sure. with armies around the world many, many years ago. But supply chain per se is a fairly new term. So almost nobody had a background in pure supply chain. Some had a background in logistics. Almost all of them had fallen into this one way or another, right? So whether they were trained as CFOs or uh, financial accountants or engineers or whatever, and they ended up being CEOs, CSEOs, CEOs. Um, and I guess there was also an element quite interesting to this profession of humbleness. Almost none of them said, hey, look, uh, I always knew I'm going to become CEO, I'm going to become C-level executive. They were like, look, I did a great job. I almost focused on adding a lot of value to the company. And that's how I made it eventually the mm. C-suite. And a lot of times they were asked, hey, do you want to take on this position? They weren't the one banging you know, their chest and saying, okay, I need to be the next CEO or CEO. So I think that humbleness is something that cuts across as well. You know, Radu, saying that none of the, almost none of them or none of them at all studied supply chain or logistics to get into this, it sounds like you almost discovered that being a successful CEO, uh, one of the common elements is understanding the fact that supply chain is incredibly important and, uh, and advancing that, right? Yeah, and, and also how we really, Knut and myself, designed this book, it's an, it's an easy read. And it's meant to be 26 stories that if my daughter, who's 10, she's reading the book, she gets it, right? So she, okay, mm -hmm. every so often, maybe she has one or two questions, but mostly she gets it. Um, if you're a practitioner with 20 years of experience in the industry, you will get it because, again, there's a lot of, um, uh, there's a lot of great stories of success that you can resonate with. So it's meant to be an easy read, but at the same time, it's meant from the 26 stories you won't remember. Nobody will remember all of them, but you will remember some that will strike a chord. Today, I was speaking to somebody that read the book in two days. Um, she literally had to, you know, whilst we delivered this book in a year, which is super fast, right? So we tried to be supply chain experts, me and Knut. <laughs> we had issues with out of stock. So once it was available on Amazon, no idea how this happened, but it went out of stock, right? So this particular individual, she wanted to buy it on Amazon, but she couldn't get it. And she actually borrowed it from a friend. She read it in two days. And her own take, key takeaway was she highlighted one or two of the stories, but she said, okay, Radu, I'm 35. 
I'm, I'm trained as a food engineer, right? And by reading the book, I was so relieved because I had a bit of an inferiority complex that, you know, some of the best leaders, you got to have a formal education. You got to know supply chain to the, to the dot, right? And I realized by reading the book, almost none of them have it. So, yeah, it's supply chain is ultimately a lot of common sense is a lot to do with soft skills and this again and again, and hence the chain model as well, again and again, something that we reiterate through the book. And it has to do with hard skills, but a lot less in a sense that hard skills you can acquire. Anybody can learn the nuts and bolts of data processing, Excel, truck utilization, and so on. It's the soft skills that are much harder mm. to get. Mm-hmm. What did you learn from writing a book? How how challenging was the process and what was sort of unexpected about it that you thought would be common sense? You realized, uh, wait, this is a little harder than I thought it might be. There's, there were quite a few, uh, quite a few things, and you know, I will admit, uh, I, uh, we, we, both Knut and myself have uh, have used. We've had a great editor. You might even know him, Vishnu, right? So he helped us sure. uh, craft mm-hmm. a little bit. So the stories were quite um, following the same narrative and uh, easy to read, right? So I think we had amazing help from uh, from Vishnu. We've had an amazing team that put it together. Claudia has done a phenomenal job finding editors, uh, uh, finding the publishing house fast, right? And b- making this available in a, a year is super speed, right? So we didn't, uh, Knut and myself didn't really have a benchmark, but it seems like a year for a book is super, super fast, right? And it already hits bookshops uh, all, all over the world. So I think that exceeded our expectations. The process, I think what what I was surprised myself, right, um, is that, piece of humbleness, right? And the fact that I have seen, I've been around 10, 15 years around the industry, right? I, I've interacted to thousands of people. I know that individuals that tend to be in supply chain, in transport, in logistics, tend to be doers, tend to be, you know, get stuff done, mm. uh, no nonsense type of individuals. But it was clear by interviewing these leaders that uh, what is badly necessary and what also this leader said is that element of how do you communicate, influence, create a story and a vision around whether you're the function of supply chain, whether you're in operations, whether you're in logistics, to explain to the business what you do, the value that you bring in the language of the business, not in the language of supply chain, not in the language of logistics, which the CEO, the board, the CFO, the sales won't necessarily understand. So I think it, was, it wasn't necessarily surprising in some ways, but it was a reaffirmation. And if anything that I, I would love that people in supply chain take from this book is the understanding and the realization that communication, knowing how to tell the supply chain story, knowing how to tell why supply chain is an enabler to the business and is a business partner, not just filling up trucks, not just, you know, uh, putting up safety stocks. That is key to having more supply chain executives making it to the CEO level, right, which is happening good old Tim Cook, and there's quite a few others. Under Armour, as you know, the CEO is now CEO. So we're going to have more of that. And that means that more supply chain executives are in their rightful place being recognized for the great job that they do in companies. Yeah. So, Radu, I'm interested because you got to edit these books and you can only add so many things into it. It's only so big. Is there a favorite story or what's the, what's the thing that didn't make it through the editing process that you kind of wish did? Your favorite story didn't make it into the book. Look, I'll, 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 you know, I'll be honest with you. Some, some heart-to-heart sharing. Of course, this has also to go to to the vetting of the companies, and you know, and I, I'm not going to pinpoint the exact story. I don't want to sure. throw anybody under the bus. Right. <laughs> but you know, there were some there were some really uh, juicy uh, elements which maybe in one or two cases didn't make it past the corporate communication angle of the particular company, right? That I would have loved to uh, to be uh, to be in it. But by and large, I think the keeping it real of the book is the fact that most of it did. So 99% of what the people said is exactly like that in the book, right? So there was some 1%, let's say, let's make it a bit more cosmetic um, to to please the public or especially if the company was listed. But 99% made it. I was asked several times, what's my favorite story? Um, I'm not going to get myself in trouble by saying that. (laughs) What is my what is my favorite story? Because um, I'm going to get 25 people that won't like my answer necessarily. But in truthfulness, um, I also find that misleading because maybe what I like, and at this point that I'm at in my journey, right, 
not everybody is at the same uh, place, right? So I may be 15 years in the industry. Somebody is maybe just starting. Somebody maybe is not even in the industry. Somebody is maybe a 30-year mark. So like anything in life, right, there's a time and place for certain things to strike and certain stories to resonate better than others. Our hope is that this becomes a book that a student would read or that, you know, an executive would read and then they will find some inspiration to think, I didn't think of that. Somebody else did it. I, I can as well do it. You know, you mentioned the out of stocks earlier would also be a great name for a supply chain book. What did you learn about the supply chain of your own book in doing this? <laughs> Actually, now that you mention it, there's a very funny story about how we came up with the title. So we actually had um, four titles, four potential titles, and we did a poll on LinkedIn, right? So, and eventually the, the title that was most voted was actually not From Source to Sold. It was a different title. The fun part around, <laughs> around what happened is, luckily for us, Claudia had the good thought process of googling that particular title which i won't mention again and seeing what comes up which neither me nor knut no you know the team had thought and when you were, you would google that you would get all sorts right from pictures to movies to songs to you know already exists a multitude a ton of content with that title so likely like you know uh, hopefully we didn't choose that title because nobody would have found the book based on that title. So it was like, okay, key, if you're going to write a book, check your Google, your potential title, <laughs> just to make sure that you don't have, you know, a Taylor Swift uh, song with sure. that name or God knows what, <laughs> right, that you do not want. I mean, um, you know, I like Taylor Swift, but I'm just saying don't compete with her yeah. on Google searches. So, <laughs> so, so that was a, a funny story. So then From Source to Soul was actually the second uh, rated. Um, there's another story that I think some people watching this and who might write uh, books in, in their future, or they want to, to, to write books, do a poll on LinkedIn. It's super useful. We did that for the cover as well. So ultimately, this particular cover was voted by our audience on, on LinkedIn, and they said that it's the best cover, right, if you see it in the bookshop, right? So that's basically why we chose this one. So that worked really well. Um, and now I forgot where I started my rambling, but uh, yeah, you should. I, well, <laughs> no, I started asking just about the, the physical side of the supply chain, but you gave us some interesting insight into the sort of the SEO information side and the uh, and the the on the shelf version of the supply chain. And, and you're right. You asked me yes about the actual supply chain of the book. So I, I mean, I, we we learned stuff like how do you actually print this, right? And how do you get this, you know, from <laughs> from an online PDF, right? Kindle version to an actual printed book. Um, and funnily enough, right, we have a war going on in uh, in Eastern Europe. This was printed in my home country of Romania, where we have a team. So we used mm. a printing house there. Well, fun fact and not so fun. The mills, the paper mills in mm. Europe are not working anymore because the electricity bills are so high, their oh. margins are slashed, so they would operate at loss, literally. So they were closed. So there's actually no paper <laughs> to print wow. books, right? So we literally, you know, a supply chain, a book that was hit by a supply chain shortage of paper. Luckily, we managed to, you know, ultimately our team managed to get the paper in time. But that was a big situation. Like we literally had thousands of books in print with no paper to be printed on. So that was a fairly fascinating um, scenario. The other fascinating uh, scenario is that now we've managed to get a few distributors. So mostly it's been Amazon. Now we have 24 other websites that took it on board. It actually made bestseller very fast, which is another clear sign that supply chain is top of mind, right? So I think there's quite a lot of people that, that are trying to read and educate themselves on it. But on top of this Amazon and all these websites where you can find it, we started making the distribution list. So uh, of, of bookshops, right? So now there's, a, I don't know, about 10 countries where you can find it. Not yet in, in US, unfortunately, we're working on it. Um, but what is, again, fascinating is we, it made from the first week, right, in, in Singapore, in Romania, in a few countries in Europe, highlighted section of the bookshop, which, again, we had no idea that is going to make it. And maybe on the fun side, one of my friends sent me a picture with this, right, in front of the horror story 
section of the bookshop. So, <laughs> you know, you can always rely also on your friends to pull uh, nice pranks and send you books from the horror or uh, fiction side. So that uh, expect that as well if you print a book. <laughs> I, I like it. And you have get some, uh, you've got good friends with good sense of humor. People who want to get the book, where do we send them to? So um, easiest for now in any corner of the world is Amazon. So if you go on Amazon, that they will deliver it to wherever you are. Uh, so again, if, if you're in, in Asia, it's in Singapore, in Malaysia, you can find it in bookshops in Europe. There's about five, six countries, but the safest, safest is Amazon. The book has a website called fromsourcetosoul.com. And, and if you want to find uh, Knut or myself, you can find us on that website or on LinkedIn for, uh, you know, for easiest, uh, easiest reach. Well, hey, congratulations to the cabo for, for you and Nut for putting that together in a year. Very, very impressive. Go to Amazon, go check out his book. Radu, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having me. Take care. Wow. Fascinating. Very interesting. Yeah. I'm going to read through that. The chain uh, sounds very interesting. You, you ever uh, write a book before? Uh, I attempted. I was going to ask if you ever read, read a book before, but I thought that might have been a little too, uh, too offensive. To just <laughs> That's a little Come offensive. right out the game. Yes, I, I was a book nerd when I was younger, man. I yeah. read it all the time. You know, people always yell about, like, the different generations of people. Yeah. Well, take a I look at what's going on meanwhile. Meanwhile. <laughs> <laughs> they yell, burn the witch, burn the witch. <laughs> That's crazy, man. See, people haven't changed in thousands of years, no. man. People haven't changed in millennia. Look at that. Like, that wasn't a scene out of Monty Python and the Holy Grail. That was over the weekend. <laughs> that was over the weekend in the United Kingdom. That's absolutely insane, dude. Just yelling at floats over there. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. I love it. I love it. It's fun, though. Do you think that if you, you if you were alive in that time, would you'd be on there with the torch setting things on fire with everyone else? Uh, yeah, probably. You would just be torching. It depends on what hate. stage of my life, but yeah, in my younger what days, what stage absolutely. of life you're in? <laughs> yeah. Season of life. Uh, at this point, I'd probably on the side going, "Look at these morons." Yeah, <laughs> but, ah, too old to be sitting. Yeah, too old to be doing that stuff. I'm tired now. I'd be the one lighting the torches, going, "You guys go." Yeah, <laughs> I'm we'll lighting the torches. <laughs> Look towards that F three. F three was the future of freight festival. It was a few years in the making. I mean, this is uh, we. It was disrupted by the pandemic twice. Mm. Supposed to be our, our our big event, and the funny thing about it is, it is I'm not going to say COVID enhanced it, but it made it almost incredibly therapeutic. After two years of lockdowns and being restricted from going anywhere, to be at an event where like that was all gone, it wasn't restricted or anything. You were free to go to dozens of different parties and hang out with people and be around everybody. Yeah, in the I don't industry. think I saw a single mask. It was so cathartic, and that's what people are saying. Everyone was like, man, this is just a really cathartic experience. I'm so glad I took the time to come out here to Chattanooga. And that was just the first one, which was a massive, massive, rousing success. I'm sure if you've been on social media, you've seen it. It's been dominating the conversation in freight social media. And the reason why is we had a a great time, and and, and we did it without anything like controversial or super negative or anything like happening there. We did it because of some amazing people. We have some highlights to uh, look back on here to take you into what we saw at F3. Let's roll the tape and we'll watch it with you and lend some comments. Yeah. And I'm doing right here with Michael Vincent the Dude. What's hey. up, brother? Hey, it's it's F3. It's here, brother. Really knew the layout of that place by yeah. uh, by the end of it. This is us checking out the day beforehand. Had to come in. And the thing is, too, you get the big nerves the day beforehand because you're like, oh man, I hope people show up. I hope that it gets filled up. excitement. This is a big place. We saw the registration. Yeah, yeah, You know, it's it right there. before Halloween. Screwing around on the stage a little bit there. Team together. The team came together so hard for this. Unlike a lot of other events, too, aside from like the union work, which is done a lot in, on the production side, the people running the event are our own people here at Freight Waves. These are our sonar account executives, uh, all the people that are keep everything going on over at Freight Waves afloat, Absolutely. right? Our operations and customer support people. We had multiple stages going on at this event. What you're looking at right now is the live stage, which is filled with. 
I don't know, five or six amazing keynotes. I was only able to catch a couple due to the nature of what we do. We're often either getting prepared for what the yeah. truck or filming segments in the hallways or, or catching up with people. Yeah, it, it seems like the better the event, the less content I get to see. <laughs> That's true. You know what I mean? That's because true. of the, all the interaction with everybody. We did sit in for Manthe, though. We made sure to yeah. do that. Justin went over and um, Justin went over and got him a What the Truck shirt. I hope yes, Tanner was, he did get one. Put that in there, like I liked. Uh, oh, this is the <laughs> Horizon the Pavilion. This is the party, man. Yeah. So the first day, the way these events work was like until 3:30, you know. Uh, and I've mentioned this on the show. That's how it was supposed to work, and that's how it actually did work until 3:30. You hung out with everybody at the event center, and then uh, the vans came out, and it was party city. Even, like, getting to events was a party. I remember seeing Ryan Schreiber on the streets of Chattanooga. Several times we ran into him. <laughs> hazing him as he ran around. <laughs> Ryan! <laughs> we even, like, there was a lot of official parties. We accidentally ended up at a few underground parties by accident. You know, I talked to a bunch of people, and there were just, like, these makeshift in-between party parties all over the city. Like, you could have walked into just about any restaurant and run into, like, five or six people, and then there were seven or eight or ten would show up. Very cool. Chattanooga Whiskey. I did not I, go on the Chattanooga Whiskey I've, tour. I've uh, been there before. I'm sure they had a great time. <laughs> Surge sponsored that one. The Surge team was out there in full force, as was everyone else's team. But I think the cool thing, too, was like not only did you get some great conversations on stage and some great conversations on the booth and great conversations on the live desk on what the truck and things like that, but like the real party was happening. It was in like that 3.30 to 6 o'clock. Cause I'll tell you what, it's like around 7.30, that's when like the, the, the second live band every day would get on. Yeah. yeah then yeah. it maybe be a little bit too loud. Yeah. But uh, aside from that, I mean, you're hanging out, but at that point you've been with people all day. You don't really need to hear too much of what they got to say. Right, 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 right. I don't know. Did they use any of my footage in this thing? What's going on here? They got any what? <laughs> they used any of my footage in this thing? Like, <laughs> I don't know. This but, uh, you know, I'll tell you what. Each one of these events were so amazing. And and the, the one day, and I forget, man, they all blurred together. But uh, I think it was Wednesday we were cruising around, checking out all the different places. And every one of them was hopping. Right? We went to, like, three or four different places that time and cruised through the different ones. And every one of them was packed. All of them were going. Because there's that nervous excitement. Are enough people going to show up? Aren't they going to show up? But, man. Everything was packed. It was awesome. There's you and the fam, man. Yeah, well, I mean, that's one of the nicest parts about having these things in town is you could have the family come right down the field, could dance with the kids out there, show them the, uh, the axe throwing and all that stuff. By the way, Richie Daigle, right, over at Tide, he went over to that axe throwing thing, and he didn't throw just a one-handed bullseye. He threw a double-handed bullseye. Yeah. I don't know if they well, have that. Did they show they yeah. have his double hand? I sent that you guys was, the that was a hand. single one, I think, that they just showed. No, I don't get the double hand. That's that's the impressive one. He just did know. the dub. Viewed on social media, I've shared that one a few times. It was so good. Uh, Charles Gracie took his son back out. Did you see that this weekend? Charles Risk, uh, Gracie went back out to the X Throne and threw some uh, with his son. Good stuff. That's the Rock City. Sea Rock City, right? No, that was the aquarium. Oh, and, my like, gosh, it was the aquarium, right? There's this, there's this part cool. in the aquarium where you can hide really easily, and it was really fun to just, like, pop out of there, <laughs> like, in the crab tank <laughs> and, and everything people. like that. <laughs> you've never, you haven't lived until you've seen a bunch of logistic professionals rub a sturgeon. <laughs> <laughs> there was even what was that, videos of the one fish eating the other fish. That paddlefish was having a meal, yeah, right? That's the circle of life. The circle of life occurred right there in front of your eyes. And we're bringing it back here next year. Next year in the scenic city of Chattanooga, which is good, too. There was a lot of, like, there were some interlopers I saw who stopped by, people who maybe didn't get involved in this one. Didn't get involved in this one. Like, how do we get involved? How do we get involved? We we'll really see you. I heard a lot here. of people saying we're in next year, man. A lot of people saying we're sure we missed it because that was a mistake. They're in. Well, you know, I saw Thomas Healy over at Highland. He was over at some other conference, and I'm like, what are you doing, man? <laughs> <laughs> like, Chris, like over here, you got U.S. Express, right? You've got all these different teams that were at these things. That yeah. Are these actual carriers. I mean, this this is the conference to be at if you're trying to push these new technologies. Same. We all need more Let's cowbell. Same. All right. Oh, no rise. No rise. I was going to say, he just threw <laughs> dirt on <laughs> everywhere. He not only dug a hole, he threw you in there, he buried you, and he threw a rise.
Uh, some of these people thought like the Cabo was a pinata. Shamed him into hitting it more than once. <laughs> What did you think of that two-team one? Was that, or is that a little bit of a cheat there by Ty? I, I, yeah, but it was a power move by Croner. <laughs> this magician was like, he was dazzling you throughout the entire event. He kicked my butt all over that place, man. He had that pick three numbers and divide and all that kind of stuff, so I picked three decimal points, and he, he got me there anyways, which was unbelievable. <laughs> And then the cube thing, what was that all about? Man? Oh, right. now four, uh, five, all six sides of the cube. My freak! My freak! God, my freak! What's underneath this table? Over here? Absolutely. Do... Well, let me, let me break it down for you. Oh, here we I'm go. from Plopper Rhymes, and I'm here to stay. Apps and drivers, we've got it your way. Come check it out and see it for yourself. Build it or take it off the shelf. Apps, devices on one platform. You go with us, show will not go back to norms. Come on down, visit me. My name's Nicole Hayes, and that's what I see. Whoa. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's pretty solid. I mean, you know, granted, she walked up there out of the audience and just decided to rap in front of everybody. F3 was a great time. I think those videos will come out um, eventually. I should have them this week, I think, from production team. We'll publish them. Then, in the meantime, got to tip some more band. Let's look at some pictures. Oh, oh. XBO is driven to put your freight first. With coverage in 99% of U.S. zip codes, as well as key routes in Mexico and Canada, XBO will help you get your shipments where they need to go That's on right. time and damage-free. All fine-tuned by over 35 years of world-class LTL experience. Learn more at Tell'em, dude. Hey, go to ltl-solutions.xpo.com. Dot com immediately after this show. Let's talk to trucking photographer Amir Shazad. Amir, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so glad to be with you guys. Where, where is uh, where are you sitting right now? It looks kind of sunny out this morning. Oh, it is, and it's a gorgeous day outside. I'm in Brampton, Ontario, uh, which is a suburb city of Toronto. So yeah, uh, and unexpected. Usually in November, it's a very chilly month uh, we get, <laughs> but uh, it's a very nice day outside. Oh, vacation wow. land Canada right there. Everybody goes to Brampton for vacation. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I wouldn't call it vacation land because there's nothing to see. There's uh, especially a as a photographer point of view, there's no um, any place to, uh, you know, you would enjoy like nature or anything. But it's a it's a cool town, you know, like I have no regrets <laughs> of living here. Yeah, yeah. Canada is a beautiful place. So, uh, Amir, uh, two million plus uh, miles safe driving, driving all over North America. Uh, for AMG Global and, and, and JB, I think JB Transportation as well, now your management transportation, how did you get into and tell us about your photography? Because that's why I learned about you is through a report that showed some of your photographs that you were taking on the road. Yeah, early, uh, earlier when I moved into Canada with my family, I was young. And uh, later I had a tough time paying my college fees and everything and uh, decided to do a trucking for a while, like for a year. But I think uh, this is a uh, many of us, you know, many of our truck driver when they come in, they think that you know I'll, I'll work drive a truck for a year, then start something else. Uh, but uh, there's no U-turn for truckers, you know. That's what happened to me when I discover USA, a beautiful Colorado, Montana, all those states, you know, like uh, it's like you keep on wanna go back there again and again and enjoy just the nature and scenic drives. And that's what really attracted me. I'm a nature lover from my childhood. I'm a photographer, like I love photography since I was like eight years old. And uh, never really uh, followed my passion until I got into a trucking. And then I started doing it and uh, everything uh, worked uh, well for me. You know, I've, I've been doing it uh, uh, since I started driving truck. And uh, it was, uh, it was, uh, it was just uh, awesome traveling uh, through those beautiful states like Colorado. It's one of my most favorite states. I could 
just go there, drive there all day and I wouldn't get tired, you know. Like some people, they don't like to go to mountains and stuff like that. But I asked my company to, you know, uh, send me to those kind of a places, you know. And uh, JB Transport was uh, one of my best uh, friends company and so as AMG. Uh, AMG is like uh, my brother, you know, the owner is like my brother. Um, wherever I want to go, I have a freedom to go. Yeah. I have a full dispatch on my phone as well. You know, nobody bothers me. Nobody <laughs> bugs me. You know, I have plenty of time. <laughs> Omar, hold on a second. Yeah, let's, so, talk, let's talk about these pictures. Yeah. Let's talk about these pictures because this doesn't look like it's taken on like a Nokia flip phone or anything like that. It looks like you got some decent equipment you're working with too. What are you shooting on? Oh, yes. Oh, oh, oh yes. I'm shooting uh, most of these pictures you are seeing. seeing I shot with my Nikon D810. It's a professional level uh, full frame camera. Um, and the, I really love this camera. I have, this camera gives me tons of memories, uh, tons of good memories and photos. You know, I just uh, uh, so much in love with my cameras. Yeah. And uh, I have another camera, Nikon uh, P1000 uh, and uh, so crop sensor camera, Nikon D5300 as well. So, but mostly night photos I take with this one. It's a very good camera and no light. And, you know, it's it will just bring a dark night into a daytime, you know. So, it's that amazing. What was the technique on that one with the, like, the flaming circle we saw, yeah, that light yeah. circle? If you guys in the back can go back about two on there. Yeah, that yeah. one right there. Tell us a little bit about how that's accomplished. Okay, that, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, so cheap. It's not like, you know, you have to spend many um, bucks out of your pocket. It's just you have to get uh, steel wool, uh, which is a super fine grade. I think it's a 0, 0, 0, 0 grade, like four zeros. And uh, you have to uh, somehow put it in the egg, egg uh, whisk or egg beater, you know, like put it in the egg beater. And uh, at the end of, you know, egg beater, just put a strap. I, I, I'm using a dog strap on it. So I was just using that and just uh, circling there my hand uh, while it was burning, you know. <laughs> yeah, there it is. So <laughs> while it was burning, right? So uh, it just makes sparks. It's throw away, you know, those little tiny sparks. And the camera shutter is open for a longer time, like 15 seconds or 20 seconds. And every spark is capturing, you know. It's uh, it's getting all the details and uh, getting everything recorded in, in a photo, in one photo. It's very cool. I love the inspiration uh, behind these pictures. Show us the the, the one with the uh, with the uh, the mirror. Where did you get that mirror, and what's the inspiration behind that particular photo? Where you have there you go that one right there. <laughs> I love that's my favorite. Okay, I was on the road. I usually uh, buy uh, you know stuff for the trucks, like clinics and stuff like that, from a dollar store. You know, just to. Uh, uh, some cleaning supplies and stuff. I went there and I saw this beautiful tray with a mirror in it. And, you know, like I, I something came in my mind, you know, like I could use this for some photographs, you know, like uh, that was last trip, uh, last week. So I took that and, you know, I wanted to try something, you know, I, I was uh, in Utah and uh, Arizona state line on I-15. And there was a clearly beautiful Milky Way, you know, uh, right behind me, you know. Like, so I just put a mirror up there. Uh, it took me to accomplish this shot. It took me like at least an hour or so, you know. I was keep on trying. Sometimes, you know, like I, I couldn't get the focus on the mirror. Sometimes I couldn't get the focus on the tray or, you know, I was keep on trying, keep on trying, spending time and getting a like, little uh, frustrated about it. And uh, finally, you know, I made it. Uh, I got this shot and uh, it, it really worked. And I took a few more shots, you know, like I, have, I was having a cup of tea in the morning, you know, the reflection of the cup uh, was looking really good. I took one of that shot. I, I, I believe I didn't send you guys that one. But, uh, and it was only $3 or so, 3 or $4 for this tray, you know. It wasn't that expensive as well. What's the key to making a truck look good on film? Uh, <laughs> well, keep it clean. I would tell everybody that, you know, I've been on the road for 19 years. Uh, if you keep your truck clean, you'll be away from the many, many troubles. Oh, keep like, the truck you know, clean. Like many, okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, all right. Keep the foot. <laughs> oh, I don't even like clean photography or like don't use too many effects or even like literally keep your truck clean. Okay. Clean your truck. Yeah. yeah. 
yeah keep your truck clean and uh, and stay safe on the road you know like i've been uh, I, i'm the guy guess i'm the only driver who wash my truck and trailer on every each trip you know i go as soon as i cross the border i'm checking the weather you know if that it's nice i just wash my truck keep it clean for my cameras for the road and for the safety as well Wow. Okay. So, in me, uh, mentioning the safety, two uh, two and a half million miles more. Um, do you find the photography is that a help to that, or what's the the secret to that safety and keeping that level head, keeping things calm? Well, I wasn't so much passionate about tr- trucking, but when once I came to the trucking and uh, I saw so many accidents on the road and everything, and uh, on daily basis, I I. When I started driving, there were no GPS or anything, you know. So literally mm-hmm. at the beginning of my years, I got stuck, you know, got into a no trucking zone, got into a residential area and all those things, you know. So I got a, a bit of practice going through those tiny roads, you know, and what to do and <laughs> everything. <laughs> and that kind of a situation. Nowadays, everybody have a GPS. Uh, I've been driving for 19 years, haven't bought a GPS yet. I don't have a GPS. What? You know, oh, you no. can ask me from here to LA, no problem. It's in, it's in my brain. You know, like I could tell you all the directions, all the truck stops, all the stops which I love to stop at, and uh, I don't really require a GPS anymore. If and whenever I get stuck somewhere, I don't know where to go. I just get a on my phone, use Google Map, and uh, enough uh, confidence from those early years that I will not get into any zone which is not a truck zone or something, you know. I, I I will have, I'll make a detour tour in my mind, you know. I don't need a GPS to guide me. There you go. He's, Nothing beats experience. He, yeah, the opposite of me. This is why I'm not an over-the-road truck driver. I, I got <laughs> lost inside, like, the Chattanooga Convention Center multiple times. <laughs> I kind of need a little bit of technology to, to help me out. I love it. Do you have a picture that you are most proud of that you've taken so far? Yeah, I do. Uh, like, especially with the trucks only, you know, like Milky Way, uh, the one you were just showing uh, in, in the one I took in New Mexico. Uh, that was, uh, this is another one. It's uh, already, uh, I make it uh, enlargement and it's in our office. And the pictures uh, you see on the trailers, they were taken by me as well. You know, the trailer wraps and the city and the truck picture and it's the same truck. This one, there you go. This yeah, is one of my favorite amazing. photo. It's a clearly beautiful Milky Way in the back. And, you know, like the truck is looking so good as well. Uh, love trucking. <laughs> so I made sure I add truck on my all photos. And uh, it was just, this is one of my favorite ones for sure. How do you control lighting at night, like in a picture like that one? It's a longer shutter speed, you know, on the camera. The camera, as I said, my camera is so good in the low lighting. It's just you have to uh, use it manually. There, there was, like, if you were at this place, you would say you can't even see nothing. I couldn't even see nothing, you know, or something. But I'm used to it, and my camera collects all the lights and everything, all little source, and it takes time. Like this photo uh, you are showing right now, it took me, like, 25 seconds to take one photo. You know, so 25 seconds, my camera shutter was open, capturing every single thing and details and light and everything. And it just bring it like this, you know, like it was just amazing to see it. That's you, when a tripod comes in handy. You ever take loads? Like, <laughs> do you ever take loads to get somewhere specifically? Like, ah, oh, I got, you know, I want to, I want to get over oh, to the Grand Canyon question. or whatever. You ever yeah. do stuff like that? Oh yeah, I, I do, I do, I do. I, I only go to California just for the sake of mountains, and uh, I'm, I'm a huge fan of stars and Milky Ways and moon and you know clear skies and everything. I'm, I'm, I live in a city, big city, you know, I hardly see stars or anything because uh, of the light pollutions and everything. And uh, it's, this is another one of my favorite photos. It <laughs> is. So, uh, uh, Amir, the, uh, on the description of this, yes. it says that airport that you got a picture there is 22 miles away. Is that right? Yes, yes. That was 22 miles away. Uh, you know, any camera, like your cell phone camera, you try, like many people, I was showing some people and they said, no, this is a Photoshop or something. This is not real. You know, like one of my friends was saying, but I was keep on telling people, you know, some of my friends uh, who are new photographers and uh, even maybe some of you don't know that 
every single camera, even your cell phone camera, has a compression. The more you zoom in, the the background will bring closer, you know, and bigger. So so that's what happened there. You know, moon was rising from the horizon maybe 10 minutes after from the horizon, and I just took this picture, and it just came out like that. It's a, it's a pretty... I had nothing to do with this picture, you know. It was just so cool. Very, very cool. Well, hey, people who want to check out your photography, where should we send them to? Well, uh, being honest, uh, I, I have a... Um, very small Instagram Instagram uh, account. It's A A M G Fleets with an S, and uh, my Facebook uh, already Michael mentioned on uh, his uh, article he wrote about me. Yeah. And uh, it's Am Amir Shazad the one. Amir, my dad used to call me Amir. My real name is Amar Shazad. So I was just going with that. Many of my friends they know me by name of Amir as well. So. Amar, that's right. even better. Amar, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you coming on the show today. No, I'm so glad uh, to be with you guys. So happy with you. I'll be keep on sharing photos with Michael. You know, he. he the, this is what uh, I got after 19 years. I I, I quit uh, in between. <laughs> you know, like I wasn't doing photography and everything. You know. Yeah. Uh, but last uh, month, uh, uh, somebody reached me from uh, Today's Trucking and TruckNews.com. Nice. And, you know, they reached me, they said, we, we saw your photos and, you know, somebody told us, like, you're a great photographer. Is it okay if we write some article about you? Like, yeah. <laughs> what nice. else? You know, I've, I've, yeah. And after that, Michael contacted me and, uh, you know, it just gave me a little more boost. Otherwise, oh, I've been driving solo for 19 years. I never drove a team. Since day one, I drove single. And uh, I, I, I think I was uh, in, lost a little bit confidence, you know, like in talking to people or doing interviews or anything. Oh, you did great, Amar. Showing my stuff, Amar, you. thank you so much for coming on the show. We appreciate it. Take care. I appreciate Thanks, it, sir. Thank you so Thanks, much. Thanks, Amar. Keep taking All right, let's take a let's round out the rest of the week over here. Let's take let's a look at it. this video. What's this idiot doing? You drive 10Ks on that? You drove 10Ks like that? Like it looks a bit more than 10Ks, brother. Sack. <laughs> it's okay? Nah. Hey, are you filming me? Yeah, filming. Yeah, no <laughs> way. Yeah. No Look way. at this. <laughs> Run far more transport. Where'd your tires go? Mate. That's bull****. Nah, mate. The bull****. You kept driving. What were we doing? What's your name? What's your <laughs> the name? double salute. That's all right. I'll go get the plate. That's all right. Where we got that? What the f*** are you doing, mate? That. that. Don't, don't, don't have to me. What they tell me not to take photos, mate? Don't tell me not to take photos. I can take photos. You're in the middle of the public. You're in public. Yeah, but... Look what you've done to the f***ing roads. Yeah, you come here and tell me not to take photos. So I don't can take photos. No, you can't afford it. It's all over yeah, Facebook, you mate. You're f***ing famous, mate. <laughs> 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 what I mean, how what does the ride occur? like to that parking lot in that, that truck anyway? Well, I, I don't know. I mean, you, you, if you slow it down and go through there, you can see how badly he screwed up that parking lot, too. Imagine the road no, I know. I mean, that just, just destroyed everything, right? Like a tank going That's through That's the there. worst part of it. like that, too, is like, so what? It's my truck. And it's like, no, look at what you just did what to the you entire did to the road, road too, and everything else. Idiot. He took out like eight He took out like eight tires right there, yeah. right? I mean, well, did one blow and they just kept going because he... I don't know how you it's do It's dangerous that. driving out there. You what could be this you could encounter process. that guy, this guy, this could happen. Let's take a look at uh, oh, man. You at this. Out. This is old school. This is a blast from the past, but I saw this video over the weekend and I just wanted to show it to you because um man, it shows look you anything can happen at any time. Look, this is a mudslide here the side of this uh right past the McDonald's, you know? And there it is. As you're driving, you're thinking, should I go to that drive through should I stop and get a Mick Delight? Should I spend that dollar? And next thing you know, the car in front of you has just gotten hit by a boulder. Yeah, that dollar menu just got real expensive. Well, it got more attractive. <laughs> got more attractive to oh, me. Yeah. I feel like, I you know what? The I think menu, I will huh? get the iced coffee <laughs> over here. That's um, crazy. You, do you own a Roomba? Uh, I do not own a Roomba. I have two now. So originally I thought they were stupid. The first one I ever got, okay. I won at a logistics conference. All right. Back in the day at non right. Freight Waves Logistics Conference, I used now? to be. I can't because I can't win like raffles and rallies at our own stuff. Yeah, but right, right, right. Back right. in the day when I was out there on the conference scene, I used to win like one rally per every event I went to. Oh, no kidding. I was known as like ra uh, like raffle dooner. You just had it, right? People just, he, I just had like raffle dooner. You had that magic People would touch. come by, you know. 
you know, yeah. girls would come by, have me blow on the dice and everything like that. <laughs> you know, they would just they were like, you can do the raffles. So are you a believer in Roombas now? That well, I want to... a Roomba. And then I'm like, they're great. So then um, like eight years later when it broke, yeah. I got a new one because they were good. Well, okay. this YouTuber, Electrosync, he's managed to make a Roomba go 35 miles per hour. That's impressive. Yeah. Take a look at how fast this thing is going. The Nerdist reports the YouTuber in question first did some research into other videos that showed the world's fastest Roomba, which was only about eight miles an hour. So then he analyzed the video. He looked at what they were using. He started 3D printing his own components. He got it up to 22 miles per hour. He wasn't content. He said, this baby can be pushed even harder. And wow. he got it up to 32 miles an hour. It says eventually he got up to 35. Wow. I mean, that's impressive. I mean, they're not that heavy, right? I don't, yeah, I mean, try putting the cats and babies on top of them when it's going 35 miles an hour, though. Uh, just getting it to go 35 miles an hour, I mean, it, well, I mean, it's low to the ground, so the airfoil of it, the nature of it, I guess, is, is pretty cool. But, man, that's some effort, dude, I mean, to, to get that happen. As a Roomba owner, though, I would tell you, I don't think it would make the cleaning go any faster. No, no you'd have to improve the suction as well, right? Because it would just skip over the dirt. I think they're I think it would. It goes, yeah. it goes, so, like, the way the Roomba works, too, is it's sort of like... It's like a blind man with a Swiffer, kind of. Like, it doesn't, yeah. the way it maps your ass doesn't go in a direct line. Like, right. it just bangs all over things, and eventually it, it learns your house and it sends the, uh, the information to Amazon. So they have yet another way to, you know, stop. Well, they you. determine how much, what size couch you need and all yeah, that other stuff. Yeah, because they're like, that's imagine, his house, right? and maybe yeah. suggest a better Roomba a bull couch to you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Unbelievable. Would you, would you go for one of them, though? W for Roomba? Yeah. Yeah, I just, never, uh, I just never bought one. I don't have anything against it. You know what you need? Like, here, here's where you need them. If you have hardwood floors yeah. and you have pets, incredible. Yeah. And actually, if you have pets, whenever you open that receptacle every single day, yeah. like before you have them, then you get one, you realize like how full it is with dirt and pet stuff. So like, do you have it running like at night so you don't... No, hear? during the day. Just during there, the day. It's kind of noisy, so you don't really want oh, it at oh, okay. night. So right. we usually have it like when we're not home or just I got the day. you. Did you get the model that'll pick up like uh, pet uh, droppings and stuff? Well, you don't have that issue. With uh, no, Randy that's Savage a fear. Is trained, right? You don't want a uh, you don't want it to cruise over a poo like no, that. No, you want it to stop and go around. Yeah, right? your house yeah. would be like a Jackson Pollock of crap. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that would be um, pretty nasty. <laughs> shout out to Walmart. Walmart on Saturday they put a parade on in Columbus, Indiana, that honored a sick little boy. I believe we have a yeah, picture of this young man. Is. Yeah, it was uh, Caleb Shrelick. He turns five this month. He was born as a micro preemie, which means he was born early and incredibly underweight. It's caused him a lot of health problems yeah. up until this point. Well, his dad works at Walmart, and Walmart decided to put on a parade, and they've made his son an honorary truck driver for this. They gave him um, a uniform. They put it on over the weekend. They had him go through town, and uh, they had a kid who's had a pretty tough life growing up. Yeah. Um, a great opportunity for him and for his dad. Yeah, five months early, 1.5 pounds. Yeah. And here he is, five years old. Prayed for him. The parade was for, for him. him as well, right? Yeah. Yeah. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Hey, here's a, here's a good informative video for you all. You ever wondering what it's where a blind spot is on a truck? Take a look at this. The truck is parked. This is a blind spot. We don't want to be in the blind spots. I'm deliberately going to go to the other side. This is a great teachable moment. Now, we're in a blind spot of a truck. Don't be in the spot. Stay out of the blind spots of trucks. Accelerate through as fast as you can. Go ahead and stop it. I would say wow. that's common sense, but yeah, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. I don't think it is for a lot of people, so we got to put this one out there. A big acquisition news happened, came across the wire right before we went on, we went on air. Warner acquires Reed TMS Logistics in a $112 million deal. It also, it, they're also getting a small dedicated carrier. If I'm not mistaken here, Reed TMS, they are, uh, they specialize, most of their freight is in food, food and beverage. beverage, is it not? Yeah, food and so beverage. that would make sense that they're getting this. Um, this dedicated carrier. Uh, Derek Leather is Warner's chairman, president, and CEO. He said, Reed TMS Logistics further strengthens their freight brokerage capabilities. They'll elevate their portfolio with new customers and diversifying industry verticals. What do you think? Goodbye? Uh, yeah, I, I would think so. Yeah, food and beverage is pretty strong, right? Like all the time. Yeah. It just depends on the brands, right? But it's always always moving. So I, I think you got some pretty consistent stuff there. I don't know a lot about Reed TMS, but I think the space is, is, is a good idea.
Absolutely. I mean, one thing I know from selling freight and being on the brokerage side yeah. is that um, it's pretty invaluable that certain carriers that are embedded in there, like especially in, for example, in Massachusetts, in the the controlled alcohol space up there. Yeah. So there's only even a couple carriers that could even touch that stuff. And if you ever wanted to compete in that freight, yeah. you had to be those carriers. You had to be those guys. Forget, it didn't matter what logo, how big yeah. you were, it didn't matter your FedEx, whomever, it didn't matter. Strong moat. Strong mm-hmm. moat around your business, right? Strong moat. Yeah. Strong moat. Well, hey. With 112 million, you could buy a lot of rotisserie chickens. There's a man in <laughs> Philadelphia who decided to eat rotisserie chickens for 40 days straight. His name is Alexander Taminsky. They've been calling him the, <clears throat> the, the Philly Chicken Man. Uh, the blog, <laughs> Billy Penn, caught up with him. And um, they asked him what he thought about this. I like, guess this was a big event over the weekend. This went viral on, on the internet. I don't know if you saw that. This was like the biggest story in Philadelphia, even though I think like the Eagles are undefeated. This kid is a bigger deal. This guy. I just heard about it today when you were telling me about this. This is pretty amazing. He just kind of did it, right? He well, doesn't even really know why it Yeah, started. I mean, the first 33 uh, like chickens he had to eat in silence. You know, the first rotisserie chickens, he didn't have a ton of traction online. Oh, You know, there okay. wasn't a lot of fanfare around him eating the rotisserie chickens. And you can see this in the pictures. He's just getting more and more depressed. He looks like um, Wolverine at the end of Logan by the, you know, the 40th day. And I don't know if they did any studies or tests on what the rotisserie chicken would did would do for you his wife um, I don't know. they said here what does your wife think about all this and i think she was pretty confused to start as most people were and then they've remained confused um most commenters want to know if you try to costco chicken he wasn't eating costco chicken he's actually eating from a local place for local people yeah um a number of people said they, they plan to come down he said the, the he said the city of philadelphia already has too much traffic <laughs> amazing stuff find me on twitter at timothy dude find him at vince the dude eat a nice rotisserie chicken Do don't it, be man. a stranger and tell him how to be hey, peace and love spread it everywhere